So here's what happens, guys. We covered in through spring. The fish are spawning. And you may be up in that grass, guys, like, like last year. Take the Ponderay River as an example. Last year we got out there and the fishing was good in the grass. Temperature was right. The water came up. Boom. The water blew up and it cooled down a bunch. What happened was the river breached all those sloughs and started flowing through them and cooled them down. So what it did is it actually pushed them backwards again. They moved out a little deeper water, waited for everything to come back around, then they moved in to spawn. They spawned up there probably in June 15th, 16th, where traditionally we've seen it as early as the first part of May. But those, all those sloughs got breached. So they just had to progress through again one more time. So that can happen. Now here's what happens. And I see this bass fishing and everything else, guys, and it's my theory of the percentage triangle again. Say we went into to this slough, or you guys went into uh, Harrison or wherever you were fishing at, Rockford Bay, Micah Bay. All those bays are good. Southern end of Coeur d'Alene is your best pike fishery. You go into there, and, and you tracked them in, and, and Seth said we were here, and we caught some good fish smelt fishing, and then we moved in, and they were in the grass, like you said, and it was great. Then all of a sudden, you know, you get into June, and those fish have spawned. What happens is, is you guys continue to go back to that same flooded grass and throw and throw and throw. I see it all the time with the bass guys. They go, man, I went back to this tree and I pulled a five pounder off of it and then I went back the next day and I got a six pounder off of it and I fished that log all summer long and I didn't get nothing. They vacated the premises. Your shallower fish or your smaller fish will stay shallow, what we call a hammer handle, you know, one, two pounders. Those bigger fish, because of their size, especially the females, and what's unique about the northern pike, along with the same thing, the smallmouth bass and walleye can do the same thing, is that you have three basic types. They're all the same fish, but three basic habits. The smaller fish generally always stay shallow. Okay? The bigger fish, they move out. Now, with Coeur d'Alene and Ponderé and those places, we're, we're very lucky because, like, say, you know, how I drew the percentage triangle thing here. All I do is I go right back. Remember how we were, we started out here, correct? Then we moved into here, and then it flooded, and we're all just concentrated right back in here. What happens is you follow this right back out. Post-spawn, these fish slide back out. In the summertime, they're way out here on that deep break again. But what's out here now is big, deep cabbage beds, Coeur d'Alene Lake. You'll pull up to a cabbage bed, and it's a vertical wall, and it's 25 feet deep, 17 feet deep. What they do is they basically back into that stuff with their nose sticking out like this, and they ambush food. Anything. Anything, exactly. They ambush food. But what's unique about pike is this, along with smallmouth bass. You've got a group of big fish that will live here. If this is 100 feet, you have a group of big fish that will live out here down 40 feet. And you'll have a group of fish, if this is uh, 60 feet, living out here right at 60 feet on the bottom. Okay, these guys here will be a wolf pack, cruising the open water. These guys out here will be individuals living on rock piles and whatever. These guys in here will be the guys living in the weeds. That's what makes them such a challenge. You can go out to Coeur d'Alene Lake off the mouth of Coeur d'Alene River in 60, 70 feet of water trolling plugs and catch pike and bass, smallmouth, out in the middle of nothing. They're out there suspended. Okay. Now. Here's the thing, and I'm going to preach the choir on this because everybody wants to kill the pike and it's my all-time favorite fish, and it's because it's a misunderstood fish. Their primary feed is whitefish. You ask any biologist, their primary feed is whitefish. These guys out here, tracking whitefish. These guys in here, perch, bluegill, whatever. They don't really eat bass like people think they eat bass. They don't. The, the tribe up that controls the Ponderé River, they're constantly monitoring that because they put a lot of effort into the largemouth up there. I talk to the biologist, Jason, up there all the time. They rarely find a pike with a bass in it. What happens is I catch bass in the springtime that have been hit by a pike. They'll be marred up. On, I got video of it. Both sides marred up. What it has to do with is they got roaming around, the bass did when the courtship was happening and things were getting territorial and they got hit. It's basically a thing to kick them out. 
Primary feed is whitefish. That's why the Ponderay River fish are getting so big, because of the whitefish. It ain't because of the bass. If, if you took in front of me and you threw down a big old steak, or you threw down a big old piece of chicken, I'm a meat and potatoes guy, I'm eating the steak. It's the same principle. A whitefish has more oil. A whitefish has soft fins, where a bass does not have as much fat, and it's a spiny ray. It's harder to eat. Okay. So keep that in mind. It's not all about, you can hit this weed bank here and you're going to catch fish. But you can also get them out here jigging on the bottom with big white tubes or trolling plugs out here in open space. It's easier for you if you're not experienced to hit them on these weed banks. Because it's a visual thing, you can see the weed bank, the cabbage, you want the cabbage grass. Now what will happen, you'll find, is you're going to see these guys right here will be active at first light and then they'll be active again in the evening time. In between those time frames, you may see them follow up, but what's going to happen is you're going to catch the smaller fish at that time. Now what that has to do with, guys, and this applies to all fishing, okay? If you go down walleye fishing and you're ripping blade baits and the bite stops, how many of you guys have been out fishing and, and you could tell me a story about how they bit like crazy and then they stopped? I preach this at every single seminar I do, right? They bit like crazy and they stopped. All fish, for the most part, have an activity window of 10 to 20 percent. Well, in a 24-hour day, when is that? We don't really know. We say, well, at first light it was good, and then in the evening time, well, low light conditions are often we're feeding for them because they're a predator, blah, blah, blah. You go out and you look at a pike. Okay, most fish, you're going to accomplish a top speed under burst of 7 miles per hour per foot in length. Four-foot pike can burst at 28 miles an hour. They can cruise between 8 to 10 miles an hour. That's pretty fast. You can't reel a lure that fast, right? All fish, guys, bass, pike, walleye. Here's what happens. You go out, and Seth, I was, I was out here off this deep cabbage bed. I followed them out. It was great success. We smelted, then we went in, and we used the, the hollow bellies, and then we moved back out, like you said. And I fished, and I was getting a bunch of fish there in the morning, and then it quit. Okay, what did you, did you, did you quit burning that spinner bait? Well, no, because they bit that. Okay, here's what happens, guys. I'm going to use the people reference. I do it at every seminar. We all sit down at Thanksgiving, correct? And we all get a big old plate put in front of us. My mother, love her to death. I got this figure from her wonderful cooking. Okay? I've been trying to get rid of this thing for years, and she just keeps putting food in front of me. Thanksgiving time rolls around. I'm a big old boy. I eat way more than I should. Okay, you sit on the, the thing, you kick the, the chair up, you watch the Lions game, you go, oh my goodness, am I full? If she walked up to me with another full plate of Thanksgiving dinner, I'm not going to be able to eat it, correct? But when she pulls that warm apple pie out of the oven, puts that dollop of ice cream on there, guess what? I got room. Okay? It's something different. It's smaller portioned. It's easy. So it's not as much, right? And I'll eat it. I look at fish stuff like I look at people's personalities and traits. It's the same thing. The reason why the bite stopped, guys, is because you did not slow down. You did not downsize your offering. Like I said, 12-inch swim bait. They'll eat it. I've seen it. They'll eat a 3-inch grub. Well, in the middle of the day like that, what do you got to do? Here's what happens. The summer heat, guys... You go out and you work on the weekend. Your wife's cracking the whip at you. You crack. You know, I can tell you guys cracked the whip. She's cracking the whip on you, making you clean, right? You come in, you eat your meal, right? And if you got a basement or something, what do you do? When it, in the heat of the day, what do you guys do? You retreat to your basement, you kick your feet up, and I'll go back out when it cools down, correct? Fish do the same thing. What you'll find in the summertime like that... Remember how we talked in the wintertime and the springtime when it's cold? You start out deep and you come shallow, then you go back out deep. Flip that in the summertime. Low light conditions, the sun's not beating down. You can see the water temperature go up 2 or 3 degrees during the day in the sun time, right? When the sun's beating, right? Well, they come in there, they fish, they fish hard, they eat what they're going to eat when it's cool, and they slide out, retreat down to the bottom, and they lay there. Oh, that perch was good. Okay, and they break it down. And then dinner time rolls around. All of a sudden, the sun's dropped, the light's not as bright, the water's cooled. They start to feed again. Okay? 
So it's a reverse thing in the summertime. Now, fall time. How are we doing on time, Dad? Good. Good? Okay. In the fall time, what happens, in this summertime phase, guys, it's, it's going to be the, the most fun for you because you're going to get a lot of visual stuff, big fish following you in. Don't get frustrated when you see a big fish follow you in. If you hopped in the boat with me and we went out pike fishing in the summertime, if this is a 100-yard stretch, we're going to sit there for 8 to 10 hours. It will flat drive you nuts. But I'm going for my big walleyes. I know this spot has them. I'm going to sit here, and I'm fishing it until they bite. Because this down here is a weed bank, and it doesn't matter if this is a mile away. If I go from here to here, these fish are in the same mood as this fish. The only thing that changes that is if they're flowing water, and maybe you've got current brushing across this place, or the wind is blowing and pushing here, and I've got no wind here. If you have flat conditions or the, the same conditions from here to here, it's the same. I don't leave these fish, and that's the, I get all the time, Seth, wh what does it take to catch those big fish? Well, one, it takes a ton of time. I put a lot of time into it. But I'm patient. My walleye spot, where you see the big night walleyes, guys, it's 100 yards long. I stay there all night. I don't move. I know they're coming. Can I outlast them? Yes, I can. I keep going back and forth. Back and forth. And then you made three hours of work, and you're like, this guy's a nutty. Then all of a sudden, the next pass through, we got a 20-pounder in the boat. Because you know they're there. My rule is you never leave fish to find fish. They're here. So I went through my progression. I fished a spinnerbait fast. Then I slowed down, and I fished mid-depth because maybe they were suspended in the weeds. Then I went and I drug a big old white tube down through there on the bottom and fished extremely slow. I went through my progressions and fished them. Maybe the conditions, they're just not going to get active. Maybe their 10% window is going to be in the middle of the day. Who knows? I'm staying here going through all my progressions until they bite because I know they live here. I know they live here. Spot on the Pond Array River. Took my dad and a good friend of ours, John Race, up there. He's from Wisconsin. I said, Seth, I'd like to go pike fishing. We parked on a spot up there. Our five biggest pike were 101 pounds, 8 ounces. Okay, and that's a stretch of water that's 100 yards long because they live there, okay? Don't leave fish to find fish. Now, in the fall time, here's what's going to happen. It's basically a reversal of spring, guys. Those fish now, you know, we had, our, we had our triangle here, and those fish were out here in the summertime. Now what starts to happen is you got your summer fish here. Remember the suspended fish out here and the fish on the bottom here? Everybody starts to come in. Hey, buddy, how you doing? How was your summer? Great. I gained 10 pounds. Okay? They start to come back, and they start to group up. Here's why they're grouping up. Coeur d'Alene Lake, Pike Leak Kokanee. Is that the problem out there? No, because the Kokanee and the Pike come in contact with each other twice a year. The Kokanee are coming in to head up the Coeur d'Alene River, the St. Joe Rivers, and they're going to go to shorelines and spawn, correct? Well, that's a mass of, of forage coming in shallow to spawn. Ponderay River, it's whitefish. Whitefish is what they want to eat there. When those whitefish come tracking out of those 40, 50 foot holes, and these guys out on the bottom, they may have been eating whitefish all year long, and these guys that were suspended may have chased some down too. But now what happens is those guys are, Ponderay River, they're coming up, they're running up all those creeks that you see, the whitefish. They're spawning in the river. We found a spot on that river this year that has a ton of current going through it. There's not a weed there. It's all gravel. But what it had was a big school of whitefish on it. We caught a 30-pounder on that spot. We caught several between 15 and 17 pounds on that spot. What it had to do with is this doesn't look like pike country, but it is good whitefish spawning habitat, and I know that they want to spawn or they want to be with the whitefish. So the forage comes in. They come in with it. Now, what people do, I fished the Ponderay River. I fished it for six days when we were catching all those big fish. Water temperature was about 42 degrees. And we were hitting those areas where we knew whitefish wanted to go, up the creeks and on those gravel bars in the river. We never saw one person up there fishing. Everybody's out duck hunting or whatever, which is fine. But the preset in your mind, once again, becomes it's too cold. What are we doing out here? Okay? These are warm water fish. As it cools down, they get more and more active. 
there's an abundance of feed. Those females have to eat to get those eggs through the wintertime. So what happens is you just go in reverse again. You don't go all the way up. I'll take you one bay for an example. There's one bay on the, the river that kind of does something like this. And it wraps around right here. And these, these are pretty tight, and then it swings out. And this is a real, real big flat out here. But out inside of here, guys, there's a, about an 18-foot hole right here. And I've been looking for a wintering spot for a long time on that river, and I finally located one. And what these fish are doing is they've come out, and the white fish right here, the river sweeps like this, and it comes down and it makes a cut kind of like this right here. And what we have out here is we've got clear gravel like this. And this out in here is, oh, it's 15 to 18 feet. But it's 15 to 18 feet, but it's running hard. It's flowing really fast. And this is almost creating like an eddy right here when it sweeps around. And what those pike were doing was sitting out in this hole, which is right where the eddy sits, and they're coming up and they're swinging a couple times a day, going into this fast water and hitting these whitefish. When the whitefish bond was over, I could tell you the day it was over, because we went out there, we didn't have one follow, we didn't have one hookup, not one bite, nothing. We slid right back in, and I focused right in this 18-foot hole. And this 18-foot hole is as big as this room. And everything around it, this, this actually right in here, guys, is shallow. This is like, uh, what is it, about seven feet, depending on where the river's at. And this bay back up in here is just shallow. So it's got seven foot of water, say, all the way around it here. Okay? So it deep, then it goes shallow, but this is out of the current, and then it goes into this, which is running. What they did is they slid right into this. And we didn't catch a fish. Okay, but what I saw, my buddy Chad, you've seen him on a show, he threw this way, I threw this way. He's working his bait in, and he goes, holy smokes, and I look over like this, and he's got one about 20 up alongside the boat, and I'm kind of admiring it, working my stuff back. I look this way, and I got one of the same size on this side. What we found, and it just so happened that day we couldn't get him to go, but those fish were all grouped up in that spot wintering. Okay, well, that is this spot on the tip of that triangle where you're going to go right to in the wintertime because those fish are going to be stacked up in there like cordwood, okay?